welcome everyone. We'll give you guys a few minutes uh, for everyone to filter in. So David, were you able to watch the balloon debate at all? No, I was moderating uh, uh, panels uh, all this uh, this first half. So okay, uh, I have to go back and uh, uh, check that out later. Hands down, we didn't get to vote for most ridiculous, but the implication that Chris Cross was <laughs> the the rap act <laughs> was the most significant crossing was hands down the most ridiculous one. I thought about preparing something about, uh, you know, uh, uh, some French politicians who took balloon trips to escape from besieged Paris in 1871 or something, but uh, all that required a far more uh, forethought than I was uh, willing and able to put into this. Oh, I just went with potatoes. So poutine yeah. and vodka, that's, that's why potatoes matter. <laughs> All right, uh, we'll give about uh, 30 more seconds uh, and then we'll get going. Okay, I will go ahead and put up my opening screen. Well, I'll let you do the intro and then I'll put up my opening sure. screen. All right, everyone, welcome to uh, session three of uh, Intelligent Speech 2022. Uh, my name is David Montgomery. I'm the host of the SIECLA uh, History Podcast. I'll be your moderator today. Uh, so far, I haven't uh, had the privilege of being able to use my banning ability. Uh, uh, so let's, uh, let's keep up that streak going. Uh, as uh, if, you have, if you have questions, uh, you can uh, type them in the chat or click the raise your hand button uh, to, and I'll moderate those at the end. Uh, but for now, without any further ado, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Greta Harden of the History of American Food. Okay, thank you. Uh, really quick intro. Yeah, my podcast is the History of American Food. I've just finished the 17th century. I'm going on to the 18th right now. And that's nice because there's really cookbooks. But buckle up because we have a lot to cover. And let's see, here we go. Boop. Um, but don't worry about boats because they're all imaginary here. So you don't have to worry about getting seasick. So let's go. Welcome to my talk about gumbo and just how many trips across the Atlantic it took to get us to 21st century gumbo. So here we are, 21st sort of consensus gumbo. For the, <clears throat> for the purposes of this particular argument, I am using the popular 21st century mainstream American version of gumbo as gumbo. What someone would find if they just Googled gumbo or looked up a possible uh, popular recipe site or just bought a popular recent Louisiana cookbook. And this is not because I'm touting this as the best gumbo and certainly not the only gumbo. Instead, it is the perfect representation of USA American food and the way intricate and regional celebration foods get favorited by American food culture and get streamlined and become the emblematic version. In so many ways, the 21st century gumbo is the definition of a perfect compromise. To the outside observer, it looks like a reasonable midpoint agreement, but it really tees off everyone on the inside that has strong connections to a particular version of gumbo and cheers for a side. So what is 21st century consensus gumbo and how did we get here? So if you look at the sort of at your fingertip sources for gumbo that I mentioned above, Big Roo has won along with Roo, Consensus gumbo contains Trinity or the Cajun version of French mirepoix, which is diced onions, celery, and green pepper. Broth is added to the roux, seasoning, and then the meats are added in the order of the amount of cooking they need. The 21st century seems to be charmed by the multi-meat gumbo and the particular meat that seems to charm the most people, sausage. From there, 
usually chicken and or shrimp to round things out and some rice on the side. Oh, an important note, almost all of the consensus recipes contain shortcuts like pre-cut veg, pre-mixed Cajun seasoning, kielbasa or other pre-cooked sausage, rotisserie chicken, peeled shrimp, something, something. All right, so here is our opening players. How did we get to this weeknight possible tasty spice stew? Where are all the bits and bobs from? What's French? What's West African? What's Caribbean? What's other European? What was here before the colonists even showed up? What's Choctaw? And what is, well, let's call it American. And how many trips back and forth the Atlantic did it take to get to 21st century American gumbo? To begin at the beginning, I'll call it the 17th century because let's face it, there aren't really any written sources to interrogate before that. It's at this point, there were three stew or pottage traditions on three continents that haven't mixed much yet. In North America, the Choctaw and Halma nations on either side of the Pearl River and around the Mississippi Delta are living their semi-nomadic life of fishing, farming, and hunting as the seasons dictated. In West Africa, Igbo, Yoruba, Angolan, and other societies along the Middle West Coast were established as fishers and farmers. And in Europe, in the areas we now count as France, Spain, Germany, and Italy, had farm-based eating habits with additions of fish and game, if one was richer, into a little poaching. So each of these cultures had soups and stews with meat bases, different seasonings, and were eaten with a starch accompaniment. Cornmeal mush along the Mississippi, rice or pounded yams in Africa, depending on the region, and pieces of bread, or maybe rice, again, if you were rich in Europe. Then this guy, this French guy, René Robert Cavier, Sir de la Salle, claimed the Mississippi Basin for France, La Louisiane, for King Louis XIV. This was after his trip up to the Great Lakes region, messing about in canoes and just like slapping French names on stuff up there. Oh yeah, and the maps he was making were falsified just a teeny weeny bit, so it looked like he wasn't making a claim on any previously claimed Spanish territory. Anyway, La Salle was working with Les Petites Nations, or the locals that occupied the lands from the Great Lakes down into the south at the Gulf of Mexico before the Europeans showed up. And these people had astounding food and game resources and sophisticated trading networks that stretch from the North Coast to the South Coast of Turtle Island, or as it was already known in Europe, North America. They controlled coveted supplies of things like seal blubber and fur, cod, salmon, corn, and the riches of the river trade, and a fish and game hunting paradise. Here we have the wonder drug of the 16th century. The Choctaw, Hauma, Biloxi, Chittimatka, and other nation, nations met La Salle at a long brackish lake, Bayouk Chupan. There they had traditions of meaty stews thickened with dried pounded sassafras, or as the French would come to call it, filet, for its tendency to make liquid thready. Anyway, meaty stews containing fish, shellfish, or fowl or game would be eaten with a variety of starches, including cornmeal mushes, the precursor to our hominy grits. And these stews were often dotted with peppers. Being so close to Mexico and the Caribbean and being a center of lively trade over water and over land, even before La Salle or even the Spanish had showed up. Meanwhile, Back around the Gold Coast, the Bight of Benin, the Bight of Biafra, and the Central West African coast, and all the way down to Angola, there is a long tradition of making vegetable-centered stews with meaty broth bases. And they were thickened with either melon seeds, a goosey, or gumbo, also known as okra. And the name depended on how far north or south you were. They were eaten by dipping into it these bite-sized balls of different starches, usually pounded yams, and here, just as the same as back on the bayouk, the thickening made it easier to eat this way, and this desire to like dip bite-sized fairish things into tasty stuff and eat them persists in our eating habits today. Hush puppies, jalapeno poppers, beignets, tater tots, you get it. Up north. In Europe, there is also a practice of making thick stews, usually known as pottage, and the dipping in instrument of choice was either hard bread or a spoon. So now we have all the starting players. Let's run the board. 
So LaSalle does his journeys. He sends his <clears throat> diplomatically adjusted map back to King Louis and the ships are sent out. So since 1625, the French had been hip checking the Spanish on Santo Domingo where Governor Admiral Columbus had planted his flag and claiming more and more of the territory for their thing, San Domingue until the Spanish gave up and ceded them about third of, a third of the island in 1697. The French went all in in their huge sugar and coffee machine to support this and then set up rice, indigo, and uh, sugar plantations around the Mississippi Delta. French, the French began to import captured Africans to work their cash crop plantations. Food-wise, a limited number of African crops were transplanted. Okra, a few beans, some dryland rice, millet, sorghum, and one stowaway. The tomato made it to the Growing Plantation Society of La Louisiane and Nouveau Orleans. Now you say, wait, tomato was a stowaway? Well, okay. So the tomato was actually an American crop from South America and specifically Brazil. And so back in the early period in the first half of the 16th century, when Portugal and the Netherlands had been setting up sugar plantations, they went to Africa and brought the tomato over there. So then when the African captives were brought over to work sugar, the tomato came with them. So San Domingue, unlike much of the rest of the Caribbean plantation industry wanted to limit their exposure to English colonial food and the cod trade. So they grew a lot of their own food. And frankly, having better taste in food than the English soon adopted the tomato and okra into their kitchens as the enslaved cooks bent French food to the ingredients they were growing in the new world gardens. So let's fast forward to the 18th century. There is a well-established French colonial presence in Nouveau Orleans and much traffic between the River Delta, the Saint-Domingue colony, and the Metropole, that is Mother France and Father Louis the King. These inhabitants are Creoles. So, and that comes from the Spanish term Criollo, which simply designates born away, not born at home. And there's not supposed to be status to it, but there always is. So anyway, these Creoles would mix with the locals, especially the Hama, the Choctaw, and the Biloxi, as well as the enslaved people working in the townhouses and the free coloreds. The business community that existed on a sliding scale of social, socially determined respectability based on the length of time one's family had been free, had been re in residence in the colony, and what profession they were in. It was complex, its rules were myriad, and it was this mixing of societies that manifested the original American gumbos. So the gumbo of the 18th century is a North American food, even if it cannot be a USA American food yet. It resembled the food of other places, but it was only possible in this particular place and time. Also at this point, it was Creole food. There were no Cajuns yet, and it was a far remove from consensus gummo. There was no roux, there was no celery, and the only pepper was red. Rice first shows up as an import from a little up north in Louisiana, from the Carolinas, but which originally came apparently from Madagascar. Um, let's see. There was also no sausage because French sausage is chopped and not ground and doesn't work well in soups. The preferred stock was oyster liquor or the oyster water that comes from dozens of oysters that accompany a chicken or a turkey or some rabbits or some squirrels. Now, if it's gumbo aux herbes, vegetable or green gumbo, those start with a veal brisket or a round steak of beef. Ham is optional. Now, if this is for a maigre dish, a fast day with no meat, you should really strain out the meat chunks, leaving only the liquor to go with your stewed and seasoned greens. But if you're a teeny bit more Catholic and prefer not even beef broth, then the fish only gumbos would fit the bill. To make up for the missing body and savoriness of meat stock, a roux made with a tablespoon of flour or two and lard or butter, depending on the season, might be in, used to enrich the stew of your four dozen oysters or 50 shrimps or a dozen crabs. Now, tomatoes are not used willy-nilly, nor are the okra. They go together, mainly, and we forget this in our grocery store age, because they were in season at the same time. 
tomatoes and okra with chicken, tomatoes and okra with crabs. And of course, when you have okra, why use filet? And if you're using filet, there's just no okra to use. So first, 18th century gumbo, as it emerges from the Creole kitchen, was using these three things, the filets, the filet thickened gumbos that come from the earliest French Louisiana colonial tradition. They tended to be the out of okra season dishes and could be a place to use that turkey or rabbit or squirrel or whatever. And the French origin is particularly revealed in the meat centric nature of these gumbos. Yep, there's onion, but it's only a supporting flavor. Second, there are vegetable gumbos both the okra and tomato ones that owed their backbones to the gardens of the Creoles of African descent, free and enslaved, and the green gumbos that made it to New Orleans by way of the Caribbean, Callaloos. And turns out there is a first cousin of gumbo just hanging out in the Dutch Caribbean. These are known as gambos or jambos, and you can find them today on the island of Curacao and in the Antilles. They, they don't have any roux, but they have okra and they are gumbo at their very hearts. Now, the 19th century cookbooks offered a lot of clues to unlocking the origins of New Orleans gumbo, but they only go as far afield as the French and British Caribbean. So there's gums or gumbo or okra or okra, and these are all names for the same thing is made plain in the early 19th century cookbook the Virginia housewife. And so when Ms. Randolph speaks of West Indian dishes, those are largely from West Central Africa and Angolan people. And so the presence of pods and dishes are called gums or gumbo. But when cooks were getting the pods from gardeners and vegetable merchants who were more likely to be from the Bight of Benin and Biafra and the Gold Coast, the Northern end of West Africa, the vegetable pod was called okra. And so even today in Nigerian and Ghanaian cuisine, there is okra or okra stews that look an awful lot like those Dutch and Caribbean giambos and jambos. So it's this mixing of coastal West African languages is how you start making gumbo with okra. It's a lot like how English names for meat animals have one name when it comes from an English speaking farmer, ox, pig, sheep, but a different name when you get it from the French speaking cook. So beef, boeuf, mutton, mouton, and pork, well, pork. Okay, so there are those Callaloos coming up from the Caribbean. And the Caribbean origin is pretty obvious because all of the gumbos Ozerbe or gumbo zeb start with a beef stock. Um, and then of course, the last group, the seafood gumbos with the roux seem to owe their roots to the crisscross of the fishing traditions of the Choctaw, Hauma, and Biloxi tribes and the Canary Islanders who were brought from those teeny tiny islands off Northwest coast of Africa to set up and operate the technical parts of the sugaring operations in the new French sugar plantations. And these ancestors who had been brought from the coast of West Africa already understood the ocean fishery and were hungry for it. And so introduced a lot of the fishing traditions, ocean fishing traditions specifically into Louisiana. So, by the late 18th and 19th centuries, Creole gumbos would be made for big parties in town. There's one account of a party that served 27 different varieties. And gumbo was made for week-long plantation weddings of several hundred people, and sellers could be found in the streets. And at this point, Louisiana was a way cooler town than any colonial town. They had a cathedral, and they even had their own con contingent of Swiss guards. So at about that point, up in north in Nova Scotia, at the same time the French had been making space for themselves in the Caribbean, the English were kicking the French off of Acadia, or as we know it now, Nova Scotia. And there was one particular group of French that had run to this island. It was mainly Normans and Bretons who had a religiously precarious situation. 
but the English were a little suspicious of all the things that were going on in the colony. So they needed an island to keep an eye on things. So they started telling the residents of Acadia, or as they wanted to call it, Nova Scotia, that they either had to become British or get out. And a lot of French did during La Derangement. So some of them went to Quebec, some of them went back to France, but some of them went south. Now this whole dispossession thing took about 50 years. And so the, even though they started kicking them off in about the 1710s, the first group doesn't arrive in Louisiana until 1765 on a ship, interestingly enough, called Santo Domingo. Upon arrival, they were just called Creole Acadians. They were still not Cajuns, but some blended into the town life, but a bunch of them wanted to continue sort of their hard scrabble, sort of self-sufficient existence. And that is where they sort of got their Cajun identity. So the Cajun showed up and they adopted gumbo and then they bent it to the circumstances they had. Initially it was served over corn grits and also did not contain roux because wheat flour was expensive. And then, the Germans, the Germans show up with their ground sausage. Now the Cajuns are hanging out with them. And like I said before, French sausage isn't good for soup, but the ground holds together better. German sausage is. And so that is where we get the andouille. Now andouille like gumbo itself has gone through its own evolution, but I can't get into it here. There's no time. So record scratch, Louisiana, Louisiana becomes Spanish in 1763. It was a secret treaty. It wasn't announced until four years later. There was like this whole uprising. And anyway, it was a mess. So something, something revolutionary war, the French quarter burns down twice and was rebuilt in the Spanish style. And so that's why New Orleans has all those like cast iron railings and they got jambalaya blah, blah, blah. France gets Louisiana back for like three weeks or something in 1803. So Napoleon can sell it to Thomas Jefferson. Ta-da. It's very complicated. He wants to pay for some more war. Let's get back to gumbo. So by the time we roll forward into the 19th century, Louisiana finds itself as an American city, but you try telling them that. Ha ha. Gumbo had now split into its two camps, Cajun and Creole. Creole was the city food. Cajun was the country food. And it really determined what style of gumbo you made. Creole was the refined city gumbo. There were three main classes, meat, veg, and seafood. There were tons of varieties and you could pick and choose which one you did to show that you knew the rules and were breaking them or staying to them on purpose. Cajun was the country gumbo fewer rules, and as wheat flour became cheaper as time passed, rice may not ha have, and so roux became the starting point. Whereas Creole gumbo was a way to separate people into their little piles, Cajun gumbo became the way to knit people together. And so the phrase gumbo yaya refers to Cajun gumbo. There's some evidence the yaya refers to rice, but really it seems to have a lot to do with everybody getting around the gumbo pot and talking and chop and gossiping. So by the end of the 19th century, the territory is rolling along and it's continuing to be a hotbed of trade and cosmopolitan culture mixing. The rest of America started to cover cardboard boxes, nutrition information, scientific cooking, food that was never touched by human hands. And religion was streamlined and calmly Protestant. It knew its place inside the church or at worst in a revival tent. Everywhere else, a homogenous American identity was forming. But meanwhile, down on the bayou, around the Big Easy, they liked their food space, spicy, had their conversations in polyglot fashion, and then went for Catholic pageantry and ate and drank and sang about it. Music was part of every day and everywhere, and not just in taverns, club recitals, or concert halls. And the end of the century wound up with a wave of European immigration from the East and Asian immigration from the West. Britain and the Northern parts of Europe had used this continent as the room to expand as there, in the words of the most cringe and mostly forgotten Schoolhouse Rock episode, 
elbow room. So now the rest of the world wants a piece of it too. In New Orleans, one of the largest groups to move in at the end of the 19th century, after the whole lemon industry builds the mafia mess in Sicily, 300,000 Italian immigrants, most of them Sicilians, move to New Orleans and surrounding areas. The Catholic and agricultural tendencies of the region make it look good. Most of them start out as plantation workers, sharecroppers, but they are also there to get in on the start of truck farming because gasoline trucks and grocery store ownership because grocery stores start then. And so they are the ones who introduced green peppers as a vegetable for everyone. So peppers and onions and Italian sausage were taking over the street carts in New York City. Green pepper was showing up in gumbo. Now the earliest cookbook recipe I could find that used green pepper in gumbo was in 1950. Red pepper pods in Cayenne had been there forever. And I know it was being used before then because cookbooks were like way up the social ladder compared to just like people cooking in the kitchen. But I looked in cookbooks in the 10s, the 20s, the 30s and the 40s. But that means finally, let's say by the 1950s, definitely, all the pieces of 21st century gumbo were assembled, filet and okra, roux, the trinity, and sausage. And there's still this Cajun Creole divide, which means the divide is very much based on class as much as anything else. In Creole restaurants, you've got white tablecloths, they take reservations, and gumbo is a course. At Cajun restaurants, they have newspapers to wrap up the crayfish crawfish, crawdads, mud bugs. Anyway, they have more room out back and gumbo is the point. And this is when Paul Prudhomme rolls into Commander's Palace. As the youngest of 13 who lived on a farm, he definitely came from the Cajun side of the bayou. Commander's Palace was founded in 1893, is a storied New Orleans uh, restaurant known as the Bastion of Fine Creole Dining, and Prudhomme created the idea of ce celebrity chef in the South and brought Cajun gumbo to New Orleans fine dining. Because up until then, Creole dining, like in the 1960s, had been trying to shed its Americanness and had just sort of been like French with a twist. Before his arrival, restaurant Creole gumbo didn't have green pepper in it. Prudhomme went on to become 1980s chef famous, and he couldn't do that, run the kitchen at Commander's Palace and the kitchen in his own restaurant, K. Paul. So he brought in, bam, Emeril Lagasse in 1982. Food Network happens and gumbo comes to the masses. So here we are. After all, is this weeknight Googled recipe gumbo really a gumbo? You bet your beads and bright red Kool-Aid colored hurricane frozen drink it is. It has the essentials. It has onion, it has frying to make a tasty base. It has a layer of herbs and spices, even just from a mix that pulls spices from the spice islands, from Europe and from America. And it's served with a starch. But most of all, it's a nod to the multi-step complexity of one pot cookery practiced by West African cooks that elevated French and African and American cooking ideas into one of the few USA American dishes that doesn't have a fixed identity. It only adds to the story of gumbo. So there's no one true gumbo and there never should be. Rather, it's a story and a long one in that. So whatever you do, do not fall for the simple story. As you can see, it took this many crossings and it is a beautiful and delicious mess. All right. Well, thank you very much, Greta. Uh, if you guys have questions, you can uh, raise your hand to ask them yourself or type them in the chat and uh, I can ask them. Uh, I'll just start out. You, you just uh, climax by declaring there is no one true gumbo, but uh, just between us, what's the true gumbo? Let's see. Here I am. Okay. 
Oh, it's the one that you make. And do you have a, a, will, a favorite kind to make? Um, I actually enjoy going back to the beginning and making the broth based. I, you know, I enjoy like the thick, heavy roux type. It's like what's available. It's just, it's very versatile. And I appreciate the ability to just travel all over it. Uh, Elizabeth has a couple of technical questions. Uh, sure. What's the Trinity? Just celery, carrots, and peppers. Uh, yes. Oh, no, no, no. That's Mirepoix. Oh, uh, the, the Trinity is onions, celery, and green peppers. Gotcha. Right. Yes. Uh, I'll let you answer the questions from now on. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I'll also ask, how dark should the ruby? It depends on what you want. It's sort of like um, if you're doing something with really gentle seafood, you probably want a pretty light roux, so sort of a blonde one. If you're doing with, if you're going to include sausage and something like turkey or so on and so forth, then yeah, like put more flavor in it, make it darker and darker. Um, also, how dark should the roux be? Well, how much time do you have? It's again, it's really up to you and what you've got in terms of time and resources. As someone who's uh, does a podcast about 19th century French history, I'm curious uh, if there anything ever went in reverse uh, of cuisine flowing from New Orleans back to France uh, in this time period. Um, not really, because that whole Creole, Criollo status, like even though there wasn't like supposed to be any like status, attached to it, there always, always was. Um, and the French, you know, they were, they were much more interested in the North African spices that they had access to. There, there wasn't really the, anything that they wanted from Louisiana, except for the coffee and sugar. I will say probably Louisiana coffee had some, some effect on French coffee. Uh, what was the biggest uh, surprise for you when you started researching this? Um, finding the, the gumbo cousins in Curacao and the Antilles, because I was looking up something entirely different for entirely different reasons. And I was like, what? And I mean, the, so there's, there's some controversy, like where did the word gumbo come from? I will die on the hill that it is the African word because it exists, you know, in, you know, the Southern end of, um, West Africa in the Antilles and in Louisiana, and it means okra. It, it just does, <laughs> and I, that it just does. Uh, let's see, again, uh, feel free to drop your questions in the chat, but otherwise uh, I'll, I'll keep a conversation going for a little bit before uh, we wrap this up. Uh, I, I will say I, to Caroline, well, you know, make sure you can show the recording to your dad because there you go. Or yeah. Uh, do you have links to any of these old cookbooks, uh, the uh, the pre nineteen twenty uh, cookbooks that might are them online for, for for viewing? Um, a lot of them can be found at Internet Archive, and if you just sort of look up cookbooks for then, or if you look up Louisiana cooking, um, on my podcast I put links into the stuff that I'm referring to. Um, the first place, and this really shocked me, the first place that I saw um, green pepper in a written recipe was in Carolina Receipts. And this is like a junior league style cookbook and from the 50s. In 1960, the Brennan's cookbook and Brennan's is associated with Com Commander's Palace. They still did not have green pepper in their restaurant gumbo. Uh, you know, some, some more technical questions popping up in the chat. Uh, Caroline asks, uh, uh, they're a heathen for using both roux and uh, filet. Uh, no, you're not. That was actually very common as things came along. And it, again, it became personal taste. The Creoles would like tell you, no, you're breaking the rules, but they would totally do it to make a point. So, meh. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth has another technical question. Uh, using a, a very very technical terms of arts here, uh, how do you stop gumbo from turning the liquid into snot? Well, sometimes you want that because if you're not eating it with a spoon and you're actually dipping a starch into it, that is what you want. But um, you can sort of 
fry the okra, you slice it up and fry it. And that sort of takes care of a lot of like the stringiness. Um, but the more I've read about it, I'm like, I think you want to embrace the stringiness. It's kind of the point. Otherwise you're just making soup. What are the, are, are there, are there close parallels uh, that develop in different tracks from gumbo in other, other cultures that are sort of gum, like gumbo, but similar? Um, I mean, and this is what I was saying, having a thicker stew that you can, you can scoop up and that sort of has this sort of hearty filling thing. Um, you look at something like, um, you know, the rice porridges in East Asia, again, you know, they're made to be kind of thick. Caroline says it's so wild. The green peppers are so late to the game. Uh, I asked if you could share what was the third part of the Trinity before the arrival of green oh, peppers. So there was no Trinity. They were either just using Mirepoix, but the base was onion, bay, and thyme. So there, there like wasn't this concept of Trinity. It and the more you kind of think about it, having these fresh vegetables on hand all the time is a very 20th century concept. Um, so like you would just wouldn't have celery year round, like th there wasn't even celery in those, like, if you look at the times Picayune early, like their gumbo recipes, they don't have celery. They only have onion. Uh, going from the history to the present, are there, do you know if there are innovations going on in what's, what constitutes gumbo right now? Are there, are there big movements or developments? Um, I would say there's sort of like the, the Google recipe and that has sort of coalesced into your compromise gumbo. But um, I think people are starting to sort of carve out like what their family's gumbo is. Like I was talking to somebody who um, the gum, say for instance, the gumbo traditions in Texas, especially within the black community, those tend to be Creole gumbos and they don't use roux or almost never use roux or just use a tiny amount of very light roux um and are you know and are much pickier about which meats or seafoods you mix together um and like andouille sausage doesn't go in everything that only has a specific place um so i think people are starting to tease these different kind of gumbos apart now that everybody has tasted gumbo like the the compromise gumbo. Elizabeth asks, uh, was gumbo ever used for divination or is that something that uh, author Terry Pratchett invented? I did not run across that anywhere, but um, that, but I wouldn't be surprised if like opening up okra pods and looking at the seeds was something practiced somewhere. I mean, that that's a very sort of common thing, like opening up pomegranates as a divination tool. All right. Well, I think uh, there's no more questions in the chat. Uh, so unless someone drops one in in the next 10 seconds or so, I think we'll just end a few minutes early and give everyone a time to catch their breath before the final session of the morning. All right. And I will head over to the, the chat room in case anybody wants to talk with me. All right. Uh, thank you, Gre uh, Greta. And uh, uh, go over to the chat room if you have further questions or otherwise enjoy uh, your next session. All right. Thank you.